So welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed lunch. Um, I hope you all enjoyed lunch and are refreshed for the second half of the day. Um, I, it only occurred to me just recently, like in the last hour, when I looked at the schedule that we had all men in the morning and now we're transitioning and we have all women in the afternoon. So, uh, <laughs> Susanna's applauding that uh, uh, on behalf of um, our, our gender. Um, so we would like to uh, also switch gears. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Division five is the division um, for quantitative and qualitative methods. Uh, the qualitative methods uh, folks joined us several years ago when they were looking to form their own division within APA. And uh, it was thought that since it's a methodology division, it would make sense for them to, to merge with us. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, and, and we've had some of our speakers already have talked a bit about um, the need for the qualitative perspective on things. So that's a good thing. But we also have uh, the, our next two speakers are um, firmly in the camp of, of the qualitative uh, uh, perspective. And I, for one, am really looking forward to seeing some of those perspectives in terms of measurement. Um, so let's first welcome Heidi Levitt, who is a professor of psychology at UMass Boston. And she'll be talking to us about mixed method scale development, combining the strengths of both parts of our yin and yang. That's not in her title, I just said that. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. Can, can you all hear me? Yes, okay, awesome. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Amy, for the introduction, and thank you to ETS and Division 5. Um, I'll be um, here talking and exemplifying the process and hopefully benefits of using qualitative analysis within the process of measure development, and especially with an eye towards hard-to-measure phenomena. And so far today, we've had many, many examples of hard-to-measure phenomena that, that qualitative analyses could be useful um, to assist with. So people have talked about um, the, the shift towards developing theory-based models for, uh, underlying assessments. Uh, or criteria for scoring that are unexplainable. How can we develop better understandings of decisions that are being made uh, when scoring? Internal obstacles in learning, so troubles in learning, um, issues in performance that are internal, that are within someone's head. The black box was a metaphor that we use. So we've heard a lot of different sorts of discussions about this. And what I'll be doing is giving you an example of two different types of measures that We've, been work we've worked on in my lab and um, the way we use qualitative measures and, and their usefulness within the, that process. One being the development of a process measure. So I'll, I'll say my content area is that of psychotherapy research. So both of these measures will be within that framework, but you could easily extend them. Um, you could extend the methods I'm talking about to pretty much any other type of hard to explain, hard to understand phenomenon, hard to measure phenomenon. Um, but the first one will be the little process measure, trying to look at, well, what happens within psychotherapy sessions when you're trying to understand silences in therapy? And then uh, an outcome measure, asking about how, does how effective is psychotherapy um, from the perspective of clients? And I'll talk a little bit about benefits and costs of it in this process. So to just give you a sense of you know, the struggle, right? the types of struggles in terms of measurement, um, the topic of silence, you can't hear it now, okay. I wish it was like a little bit longer. Okay, the topic of, is that better? Yeah, okay, thanks. The topic of silence is enigmatic. So um, psychotherapists have been writing about silences for decades and decades and decades since Freud, talking about issues around, you know, is it, does it indicate emotional attunement? which seems positive. Is it struggle? Is it just processing time? Maybe it's trust and intimacy, which sounds like a lovely thing to happen in therapy. Maybe it's rage, <laughs> which maybe isn't as good a thing to happen in therapy. So there's so many varied understandings and explanations. And, um, and so this was actually my dissertation project, and so you'll see the data references. But at that time, looking into the literature, it was completely conflicted. So for every study you could find that said silence was a good thing, it related to good outcome and positive alliance, there was a study that said that it related to poor outcome and poor alliance. 
So completely divided literature. And, um, and we also know that it was one of the most difficult skills for therapists to learn, allowing silences, because people didn't know, it was confusing, what did it mean? What is it saying, right? Um, so here, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an example to show you sort of what is this struggle in terms of the inference. Um, so I'll ask you to, let me see, can I get someone who could be a client for me, who could read the client part? Awesome, thank you, Amy. So I want you to imagine that you're in this therapy session, all right? And, oh, you're gonna come up, awesome. So here, the client was describing feeling depressed. And the therapist had been asking her, right, to consider what could she say to herself to help her not be depressed? And the client was struggling, couldn't really do it, couldn't think of anything to say to herself. So the therapist tries another tact. So the therapist says, what would a friend tell you? A close friend. Somehow, somehow, that doesn't help me. Okay. I'm very negative. Awesome, <laughs> that's beautiful. Um, what, okay, what would you like to hear from a close friend or what would you tell a close friend, sorry, who was in your shoes? I, I suppose I'd, I'd tell a person in my shoes to have enough confidence in their ability, their proven ability to set limits. Is that, is that evidence against the depressive thought? Okay, seen. <laughs> so was that 34 seconds? It's hard to tell, but 34 <laughs> seconds is a really long time to hold a pause in therapy. And, and my definition of a pause was three seconds, because even that is really noticeable. If you practice in your mind a three second pause, it, it's really noticeable. So thinking about this, what do you think the therapist was thinking? What do you think the client was thinking? Do you have ideas? What do I do now? The therapist was thinking, oh my gosh, what, what do I do? What about the client? What do I say? What does the therapist want to hear? What's happening? Um, I'm not sure. So, um, so there are many pauses, and they have very different feelings. And so we decided, well, I decided what, what I would do would be to conduct interpersonal process recall interviews, which is a type of interview where you watch a video of a session with a client, and you have them stop the session, this video, and remark about what's happening for them in specific moments. And sometimes the client can control that, sometimes you can control that. So this is the client's description of what was happening during those seconds. Um, so the client says, the idea, this is what I'm being asked to do, is what would a friend tell me? If you can't think of what you would tell yourself, but they've said all the wrong things for a long time, my friends now. So. I was remembering that they hadn't been terribly helpful. And then I asked her about the next pauses and that little, little bit. Now I'm in a position where I have to tell them something that will be quite positive. I don't have anything left for them, is what I was thinking. And then knowing this is a theoretical situation, and actually the friend I'm talking to is myself, and I probably don't have that much love for myself either, right? So then I'm stuck. I know how I talk to myself. Not so good. So if I say this thing that the therapist wants, it feels like a lie, because it's not. It's it's not what I tell myself. It's what I should be telling myself. If I were my friend, if my friend was supportive. So it got very convoluted. I wasn't forgiving my friends for the past year of letting me down. I wasn't letting myself off the hook either to do the leap of completing the task. When asked what she was experiencing, the client said, "Oh, just disbelief in what I just said." She later described the pressure to come up with the right answer as, as feeling like she was on jeopardy, right? I feel like I just have to get the right answer and get the ding, right? Um, so you can see that there's a lot happening and some of which you, you might be able to guess, some of which you might not know. You might think that the client was really engaged in trying to answer the, pressure, the question. Um, so this was just this one sequence of pauses within um, seven interviews that, that I had done, which where we looked at 318 silences. 
And this is, the method I used was grounded theory, where we took the transcripts of these sessions and we divided each of the sessions into meaning units, which is a term from phenomenology, where we, um, where each unit contains one meaning about a silence. So some silences would, would have many, could have multiple meanings about them, some only one. Uh, and then we would group them together using a process called constant comparison to, to develop categories of common, common sorts of meanings, right? And then once we had the, these categories, sort of the bottom layer, we would compare the categories to develop higher level categories, right? And see if we could group them together and see different sorts of trends or dominant sorts of silent processes that were happening. And guided by saturation, so at some point you stop having new information that's incoming. So at around 200 pauses or something, there was no new type of pause that was coming in. It was just the same types of pauses over and over. So then you know to stop. So here, we develop, I developed this um, pausing inventory category system that had um, seven different types of pauses. Some were productive, some were obstructive, some were neutral. So this helps to explain why half the literature was saying this was a positive process and half the literature was saying this is a negative process, right? Um, and so that was informative and useful, but I thought it would be useful to move further to create some sort of coding system for researchers so that way we could try to identify these different kinds of silences and um, use them within future research to not keep repeating this, this error of, of um, tabulating them all as though they were a homogeneous variable. So, uh, so I began to look at the transcripts where the clients were having those moments in the sessions alongside of their interviews to note discursive features within each type of pause and looked at the speech patterns, length of pauses, and session processes, contextual dynamics, to develop a list of cues that are really a rating system that could, people could use to characterize these types of pauses. So that way we wouldn't have this issue in our future. Um, and this also could be very helpful in terms of training therapists as well. So therapists could see, um, could learn to become sensitive to the types of pauses that are happening in their sessions and know that when there's a good pause happening, if a client's really, for instance, engaging in contacting an emotion, feeling it, beginning to label it, beginning to make sense of it, that's the kind of pause you don't want to interrupt, <laughs> right? And if a client is um, disengaging and withdrawing and shutting down because there's something threatening happening in the room, that's the kind of pause that requires support. And so it, it has a very pragmatic sort of utility in helping people to, to think about what they should do in sessions. Um, and then in terms of research, there, there's also these other findings that we found. Um, because now that you have this measure or this typology, you can begin to use it within quantitative research. You can begin to count different types of silences. You can correlate them with good and poor outcome. And so we did, and we found generally that the good outcome um, sessions were, were associated with the good silent processes and poor outcome sessions were associated with poor silent processes and those, those sorts of things that you could begin to do, right? Um, and um, so a useful thing going back, so we talked a little bit about content validity, is that this process means that this typology is, has an inherent form of content validity because it's rooted in the description of clients' experiences about their pauses. And so right, right away in using this measure, I know where these, these uh, categories came from. I know that they're grounded in people's actual experiences who, are, who have lived the experience that I'm concerned with. Um, and also it, was, it, it allowed me to have not only client reader um, reliability, but also, sorry, not only inter-reader reliability, which is typical of process measures, but client reader reliability, because I had what the client said was happening for them in these moments also. Um, and then it's just being used in different places, okay. So this is sort of giving you a little bit of a sense of a measure used um, to look at process, so what's happening in the session, right? And this was used from a primary study uh, of, um, of silences, right? So now I'm switching over. Okay. And um, to outcome. <laughs> so, um, so psychotherapy outcome measures. So most commonly, um, psychotherapy outcome measures 
are the most commonly used measures to evaluate psychotherapy outcome are symptom-based measures. And I'm sure that you all have completed these when you've gone to your GP and they give you a list of, of items saying, are you sad? Are you anxious? Over the last week, how anxious have you been? How sad have you been? How worried have you been, right? And you have to hand that in with your descriptions of your kidney problems or whatever else is going on. <laughs> and so they're super common. Um, but, uh, but they're problematic for a number of reasons in evaluating psychotherapy. Uh, one, is that, one reason is that psychotherapy orientations, they target symptoms differently. So some psychotherapy orientations, they focus on, on symptoms as a primary goal of the, of the therapy. Clients come in, they say, what are your symptoms this week? They rate them, they come in the next week, they, they develop interventions for those symptoms, they come in the next week, they say, how have your symptoms been now? They re-rate them, they fine tune the interventions, right, until they work. Other orientations, they don't focus on symptoms as a primary goal. They focus on things like developing insight, right? So the conversations would be more around things like, um, what are the interpersonal issues you're having in your life? How do those relate to the, issue, the issues in your childhood, right? How do you feel like those patterns are crossing over? How do you feel like they're changing? Symptoms may not be at the forefront of what's being discussed in the therapy. And it, it, it may not be something that's discussed ex explicitly at all. Um, and so the goals of those orientations are not being measured when, you, when you're just looking at symptoms, right? And often, um, when you're looking at randomized control studies for psychotherapy, what you're, what you're comparing is different psychotherapies that may have very different values and beliefs about what goals of therapy should be. Um, Symptoms also can change for reasons outside of therapy. So there could be different reasons why your symptoms change. There could be something that happens in the um, sociopolitical climate, right, at, at a certain time, right? I know there's been many of us looking at our phones today, <laughs> seeing what's going on today, right? Um, there could, so there could be different things that happen. Uh, also, um, part of my experience as a qualitative researcher interviewing many, many clients has been that many clients don't come to therapy because they want symptom change. Many come to, some, some do, but many come to therapy because they want insight, they want to understand their lives, they want better relationships, they want to feel more complete as people, they want to develop goals for themselves, they want, there's many different reasons, right? Um, so, um, I became interested in developing a, a better understanding of why clients what are, why clients are coming to therapy and how clients understand outcome. So I thought, well, we'll do, I'll do a meta-analysis. So we did this qualitative meta-analysis and you can, um, we looked at, we ended up finding, uh, we looked at studies that were English, no, no analog treatment, so it had to be actual real therapy that the clients were in and we focused on individual adult therapy. Uh, we did, um, we started off with 3,400 um, some odd su uh, studies and boiled down to 109. Uh, and, um, and these were diverse studies. So we had studies that focused on, um, that used different methods, many different qualitative methods. We had many different orientations, all of the major Orientations were represented, and a number of orientations I'd never heard of were in there too. So there was a lot of diversity there, um, a lot of many different topics in terms of therapy, right? And so we were really interested in trying to find out: well, what are the core? What are the central sorts of reasons? What are the most common reasons why cl what, why clients come to therapy, and what's beneficial to them in therapy, right? What's helpful to them? And um, so we began off, we ended up using a multi-method meta-analysis. We um, began off actually doing a grounded theory study, and um, which was sort of following the, the sort of process that I described before, but in this case, the, primary, the um, primary units of data are the findings within the primary literature, right? So instead of having an interview that I'm drawing my, primary, my units from, I'm drawing my units from the findings from other studies. And so those would become my primary units, and then I would go through this process of constant comparison, comparing them to each other to develop, which is um, a very intensive process where you're comparing every unit to really every other unit in different ways, and then creating categories. Um, 
and then creating categories from those categories, and so in this way developing this hierarchy. Uh, also using con consensus within our team to talk about this process of coding throughout. Uh, we developed a hierarchy that had uh, one core category, five clusters, and 50 categories, and so this was our um, analysis. Um, after we, so it was multi-method in that um, this is what we submitted as our, our first paper was just the granted theory analysis. We submitted it to SegBulletin, and they said, um, we'll publish it, but we want you to include, we want you to go beyond the point of saturation, beyond the point where, so at that point we had 67 studies, and the last 20 we had no new categories, right? But there really were more studies in the literature. We had 109 studies in the literature, so they wanted us to include those other ones. So we shifted to using a content analysis. So we already had the hierarchy that was grounded in um, that close examination and development of categories from um, the primary findings. Um, and that was saturated, it was pretty stable. So with the other findings, we more um, placed them into the hierarchy, right, to help us move forward uh, and um, reduce the, the time intensity, really, of the analysis. And, um, so then, so this was our, that, this was that paper. Our next step was then to think about, okay, so now we have this description of what clients find to be important in therapy. How do we develop a measure? So we began looking at the, um, and so what's lovely about granite theory, I think, in terms of measure development, is you now have this very close uh, read of, pe of people's initial experiences or, um, differentiations within people's experiences that's organized in, in a conceptual sort of map. And so we were able to, we took our 50 categories and we developed an item from each category that would capture that type of change that clients found important in the therapy process. And um, so we had a 50 item initial kind of scale that we were working with. And then from that point, we used a principal component analysis, but you could use an, a, a factor analysis or um, other methods to, to analyze our results and created a 15-item shortened version of the scale. And so just to give you a sense um, of some of the items, you can see that a lot of these are items that aren't appearing on other, in other sorts of outcome measures because they're coming from clients' descriptions of their own experiences. They're not coming from therapist theories of their therapy. Um, they're not coming from a priori, priori ideas of assessing um, change. So we have uh, items here like, um, my therapist helped me develop new interpersonal strategies. Um, I felt disconnected because my therapist didn't seem to hear what I was saying. My therapist checked in to hear how I was experiencing what was happening in session. So these were, these were all experiences that clients said over and over and over and over in, in multiple, many studies. These were, the, these were central things for them. Uh, I felt safe talking with their therapist about vulnerable issues. Uh, my therapist's acceptance helped me look at parts of myself that I don't usually like to look at, right? And they're very carefully worded to try to capture the common experiences of, of these different sorts of clients. And, um, We've been uh, pretty happy with the um, reliability and uh, inter-item coefficient, reliability coefficients that we've had. Um, and then you could continue to conduct from this kind of basis any typical uh, methods that you might want to use to evaluate your measure, right? So we looked at, um, we looked at, we were very concerned about having internal consistency across therapy orientations and across different types of de client demographics, so we looked at that. Um, we looked for test <laughs> test reliability across these. We looked at um, our correlations with other measures. We ended up having moderate correlations with other measures, which we were happy about, because we it indicated to us that there was something unique that we were capturing beyond just symptom measures. Um, and especially we were happy that it looked like there's some promise to predict dropout in therapy, which is, which is, um, uh, which, which these sorts of measures have been, have been 
um, used, there, there's an effort to try to use these measures in that kind of a way to try to support clients to not drop out of therapy prematurely. So, um, so but you could, you could, you know, look at really anything, um, depending on the kind of measure focus you had. And, um, and then in terms of advantages, uh, one is that it, it allowed us to really render measurable and um, differentiate these constructs that are typically very opaque. So silences, it was a mess, the literature, you couldn't make sense of it. Um, this has been something that's been useful in terms of differentiating those processes that would have been very hard to, to track um, and get a handle on. Uh, with this experience, the internal experience of clients, likewise, there is, there is um, it's, I think, been a very pressing problem for psychotherapy researchers, which is why there's so many studies, you know, 109 studies is a good number of studies, uh, so that we've been able to look at that. Um, and that allowed us to do a meta-analysis, which gives us even more confidence in the measure. Um, and um, let's see, it also allows us to give con context-sensitive feedback to therapists. Um, and I guess the the last thing is that I, I really like the, the approach of having a, thinking about a critical multiplicity perspective when it comes to methods and thinking about how you can develop more robust programs of research by consulting and integrating methods that are varied and that have different strengths and different weaknesses. And so, um, so we're quite excited about this idea of developing this measure that has both the qualitative and these quality, quantitative kinds of aspects interwoven. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. They're they're definitely conveying a lot of information. We find that um, when we do when we ask people to transcribe psychotherapy, we have them type in all the ums and ers <laughs> and time the the silences because all of that is information that's really useful in trying to understand communication. And um, and we find also that if you can have audio recordings, so much better for for reliability in in coding because all of that gives you the context, right? It tells you what's happening, the dynamic. Yes. Yeah, I think you might be interested. There's been research on teacher behavior that's very similar. The teachers ask questions of students, and then on, on typically they think they're waiting a much longer time than they are, but the average has been shown to be three seconds. Yeah. And and they get too impatient and they then answer the question themselves rather than waiting. And there's a fair amount of research on that as well. And, and it just seems like there might be some, some similarities across the disciplines. Yes, I think I think that there is. I think this is why for novice therapists. Even that is like a long pause, <laughs> right? It's hard. It's hard to hold a pause for a while. But clients are, are you know, they some again, some of the pauses are not are obstructive, but some are essential. It's the time when clients are thinking and making sense of things and and um, internally processing and cutting those moments off. You're just you're handicapping your client, right? So um, and that, I think that's like that with many different, I mean, the, I don't think that these types of silences and internal processes are unique to psychotherapy. I think they happen across many interpersonal types of contexts like education. I was thinking it's sort of like an, an analogous thing to like we're looking at process data. Some people will talk about process data and uh, educational testing and computer testing, how much time people spend on an item and, and the strokes and how they go through things. But this is, this is like a different version of it. 
Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. Can we talk yeah. about the coach uh, and the coach uses. What did you guys talk about? How a coach uses play acts. Oh yeah. Right. yeah. That was Randy, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 But it, it was similar to when yeah. you went through the finances with the client, right? Yeah. 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 Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.